Zaitsev's rule in chapter six, we're only gonna use Zaitsev's rule as a tool to help us choose the primary E1 product. And then in chapter seven, we are going to talk about Zaitsev's rule again, and we're going to explain why it is the way that it is, and we're also going to learn it with a little bit more detail than we do in chapter six. The Zaitsev's rule says that the most substituted alkene, the more R groups you have on an alkene, the more substituted the alkene is, the fewer hydrogens it has, that alkene is the most stable alkene. So if you're comparing two alkenes side by side, the one that has the more R groups on it is the one that is the most stable. And the way that this applies to E1 is that the most stable alkene is going to be the primary product. So this is going to help us uh, when we are trying to predict in this step right here, for example, which hydrogen we should abstract. Should it be these, one of these hydrogens or one of these hydrogens? And we're trying to decide which alkene we should form. We use Zaitsev's rule to help us predict. It doesn't apply to this example because this molecule is symmetrical and really simple. But in the next three, next two examples that we do, we're going to use Zaitsev's rule. So here is an overview, like a, a picture of what Zaitsev's rule looks like. An alkene that has four alkyl groups on it is the most stable. If you can ever create a tetrasubstituted alkene in an E1 reaction, you're good to go. The next most stable is going to be an alkene with three alkyl groups, like that. The next most stable is going to be an alkene with two alkyl groups. And there are three different ways that you can put two alkyl groups onto an alkene. Here's one of them. Uh, that would be cis. Or you can have them trans. Or you can have both alkyl groups on the same carbon. In chapter six, we are going to consider all three of these situations as being equal in terms of their stability. In chapter seven, we're gonna learn that there is a difference between these three. But for now, we just wanna focus on four versus three versus two versus one, which is the least stable. Okay, so with that, with um, Zaitsev's rule and a really basic mechanism for E1, we're going to now do three pretty tricky examples. Okay, so first example, we have uh, this would be 2-bromo-3-methylbutane, and we are going to react it with methanol in some heat. And the question is, what are all... all possible products of this reaction. And there are going to be a lot. When you look at the combination of alkyl halide with the alcohol, this should tell you SN1. You should see this and think SN1. You've got an alkyl halide, it's secondary, but you don't have a strong nucleophile. You have a weak nucleophile, so that's SN1. And any time you think SN1, you need to simultaneously be thinking E1 because they're going to happen at the same time. They compete with each other. So in drawing this out, what we want to do is start by forming the carbocation because that's always the first step, whether we're looking at an E1 
or an SN1, get rid of that leaving group, and make the carbocation. Like that. And then I drew that hydrogen in. It was here. Okay, so because um, the SN1, this is the first reaction that we learned. Let's do the SN1 reactions first. This is a secondary carbocation. You do know that you can just have a direct attack with the nucleophile right on to that secondary carbocation. And we're going to get this transition state which gets cleaned up with another methanol molecule, a methanol abstracting the hydrogen, putting those electrons back onto the oxygen as a double bond. And that's an SN1 product. But that's not the only SN1 product. This is a secondary carbocation. So you need to ask yourself, is there anything that I can do to make that a tertiary carbocation? Is there anything the molecule can do to make it a tertiary carbocation? And remember, you can shift things from the directly adjacent carbon atoms. So here is one of our directly adjacent carbon atoms. That carbon atom has some hydrogens. We could do a hydride shift from here to here, but we don't want to because that would put the positive charge on this carbon and that's a primary carbocation that is not stable. So we don't want to move anything from this carbon. Let's look at this other adjacent carbon. There's only one hydrogen on it, two methyl groups. We could do an uh, alkyl shift, a methyl shift, move this whole entire CH3 group onto that carbon, put the positive charge here. This alkyl group would be gone, so let's cover it up, pretend like it doesn't exist. That would be uh, secondary carbocation and so that also is no more stable than what we're starting with we're not going to do that a third option would be to move this hydrogen in a hydride shift up here to that position and if we lost that hydrogen the positive charge would be on this carbon that would be a tertiary carbocation that would be more stable so we're going to do a hydride shift to form a more stable carbocation. And there now we're going to have two hydrogens up here. And these three hydrogens, we didn't do anything with them. That carbocation can also be attacked by methanol, the weak nucleophile. And that'll give us this intermediate, which will then react with another methanol. To give us this product. And these are the two SN1 products and you should ask yourself of those two SN products, which one is major? Which one is minor? The answer to that question is the product that came from the more stable carbocation is major. This is not the major product of the whole entire reaction. That's just the major SN1 product. The other is the minor SN1 product. We also have a bunch of elimination reactions that are going to take place. That's going to have to come on the next video.